has been really good to me and um, just before I got appointed here we had figured out a bunch of things and I actually have not lost my vision since I've been your pastor. Wow. And that's a, that's a big wow thing. That's a huge wow thing. So anyway, so we're in the middle of the why series, why to tell others, and it's about Jesus. Okay? It's not to tell them about the weather. Okay, to tell others. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15. So this is um, the seventh week of the why series. We've got two more weeks after this. The first week, knowing why, lets you shine. Second week, worshiping God is the natural result of understanding God's love for us. The third week, uh, worshiping God, following Jesus, going to church doesn't mean that you'll never have storms, you'll never have tough times. It means that God will be with you to prepare you for it. Uh, the fourth week, to be better people. God doesn't just want us to come to, to God to be saved. God wants to help us as we go through life to become better people, to be salt of the earth, to be people that are capable um, of being the people he wants us to be. Uh, well, week five was to move beyond ourselves. Part of that is once we have a relationship with God, we're able to look at others through the, the eyes of Jesus. We're able to look at others and say that God loves this person as much as God loves me. Therefore, if God is their father, then I should treat them with the respect that the father's child is deserved. Um, and then last week was to remember Christ. Uh, in the, uh, uh, the communion, to remember Christ as a part of our monthly ritual, to examine ourselves in light of Christ's love, are we doing what we should be to grow closer to him and to love our neighbor. So this week, um, we're telling others about Jesus, but first I have to have a word about Charlottesville. Um, and if you don't know, uh, Friday night there was a Klan rally in Charlottesville. They went with torches in the night through the town. Um, and then yesterday morning, they were gonna have a big uh, protest, and then there was counter-protesters, counter and they started throwing rocks at each other. Um, and then they canceled the protest, and they made everybody leave. And then somebody, we don't really know who yet, drove uh, his car, they've arrested him, it's a him. I don't know if this person was involved in the Klan rally or not, but they drove into the, the crowd of counter-protesters and killed one and 19 went to the hospital. And then two more uh, policemen died last night when the helicopter that they were using to kind of uh, do crowd control crashed. And we don't know why it crashed, but where it crashed, we think it didn't, it, we don't think it was shot down, we think it just had mechanical failure, at least right now. So these things are going on, and the bishop sent us an email last night in this regards to, to mention these things and to, to, say, to say something. And, and before I do, uh, first of all, I love our bishop. He's a great guy, and he's absolutely right to ask us to say this. Second of all, I want you all to know that I strongly believe in that the doctrine of the separation of church and state is a Christian doctrine founded by Christians to keep the church from being too entangled in the world. Uh, you can be a Republican and love Jesus with all your heart, and a Democrat and love Jesus with all your heart. And you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and think that our politics should be to feed people. And you can be a, a, a Christian with all your heart and feel that our politics is to teach people how to feed themselves. You know, the old, do you give them a fishing pole or do you give them a fish and all this kind of thing. Um, and I think Jesus loves uh, people, and I, I want Democrats to feel comfortable here, I want Republicans to feel comfortable here, and I want people who don't know me, who listen to my sermons, to have no idea how I vote. Right? With that said, um, there's nothing American about marching under a Nazi flag, and there's nothing American about burning, or there's nothing Christian about burning a cross. And um, I'm a child of the South. Uh, my ancestors came to America before the American Revolution to Virginia. And they've slowly moved west. And uh, uh, I found out about six years ago that I had ancestors that owned slaves. And I really was torn. You know. Um, and uh, my mom and I talked about it. And she said, well, you know, we lost all the money we had in the war. There's not a penny that you have that you can trace to that. And for some reason it made me feel better. Um, 
you know, the other thing is the way I know is because they were listed in a will and, um, you know, my ancestor, he only gave like a page and a half to the rest of the plantation, but he gave a whole paragraph to each slave. It made me think, wow, could you really, in that system, try to be a good Christian slave owner? And, and, and it made me think about so many different things because that's why there was a paragraph, because there were restrictions. And if you ever mishandle or mistreat your slaves, you will lose them. And they will go, and, and you know, I had to say to myself, I can't really judge my ancestors or think that they taint me, but I have to ask myself. And I went through a, a long period of searching, and I, um, you can go to Yale online for free. And I took the Yale course related to the Civil War and, and learned a lot of things that I didn't know. And one of them was that you can't, um, well, uh, most slaves weren't bought with cash. They were bought on a mortgage. And that's how most African Americans learned who their ancestors were by going through the mortgage records because they're still there in every county courthouse in the South that hasn't burned down. Um, and the value of all the mortgages in the South on slaves was more than the value of all the factories in the North. And the deal was is that when you're enslaved by a mortgage to something, you don't have the moral ability to analyze it. So instead of judging my ancestors, I ask myself, are there things that I'm enslaved to? That my money is so entangled with something that I refuse to examine it morally. And uh, in regards to our politics and what the bishop wanted to say, um, you know, we can be non-political to a fault, and I don't want to be. And I hope for and I pray for all my Republican friends that in the midst of them wanting to, uh, to have uh, an economy based on capitalism, that they can understand that that will necessarily have some results and that we should have a safety net for them. And I pray for my Democratic friends that, um, that in the midst of wanting to have safety nets that we have to examine what they do to people's hearts and if they're really helping them or not. Um, and I pray for my Democrat and my Republican friends that they don't get so caught up in the rooting for your own team that they don't see the log in their own eye for the speck in the other one's eyes, because we're all sinners. And we need our politicians to, um, to rise above it. And as someone who's been very active in politics, and I'll tell you, I, I got involved in politics as a way to run away from my call to ministry that if God elected me to the city council or that if God elected me to Congress, um, that, uh, that that would mean that I've misinterpreted. Because you, you know, to get elected to Congress, you've got, you know, God's got to do something. That's crazy to think that just an ordinary guy could do that. Um, and getting really involved in that, I realized how there's so much pressure for just ordinary people to cave to the system. And so we've got to pray that people in both parties will have strength to be above it. All that said, the bishop just wanted us to think that as Christians, we need to be sure that we're making our society better and we're not allowing ourselves to be uh, disabused of the idea that there's anything Christ-like in bringing violence to uh, our protests or judging others. And I thought about telling the story that my grandmother taught me, but that's for another day. Um, so while we're talking about these things, so the state of America in regards to Christianity. I don't know if you know, but um, some funny stats here. 40% of Americans say they're churchgoers, but on an average Sunday, only 18% of America can be found in a church, which actually is not that wrong because we as Methodists consider you regular if you show up at least once a month. <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding. Okay. Yeah, well, there you go. sleep in the other three? No, you can't. Good question. You cannot sleep in the other three. Um, and, and I'll tell you this, just, you know, for, for your own benefit. Um, uh, you know, in, in, in a couple of months, we're going to be having a, a sermon series called the How To Series. And one of, the, one of the sermons will actually be How To Fast. And I will tell you, when you fast... 
after a period of time, you forget that you need food. Hasn't happened yet. Hasn't happened. <laughs> Watch out, watch out. Um, so uh, there, will, there will become a time if you get out of the habit of going to church that you even forget what it's like to be fed spiritually. So make it a habit of being here every week. But with that said, 65% of Americans have no church affiliation at all. That's 156 million Americans that are unchurched. And uh, worse than that, in the last seven years, and this is actually old data, this covers uh, 2007 through 2014, so it might be worse than this. Uh, these last two are from the Pew Institute. Uh, in the last seven years of that study, people who call themselves Christian and have changed to non-affiliated or who say they're atheist or agnostic is now uh, up to 7% of the country, is up 7%, and people who identify themselves as Christian is down from 78% to 70%. 4% of that is within mainline denominations like Methodism, 3% within Catholicism, and only 1% in others. Uh, but right now, even the evangelicals are not really growing. You know, and I don't have the answer to why, that's just the state of America right now. So when we take a look at the scripture that we read earlier during our time, it was very interesting that we take a look at what Christ did for us and we take a look at that and we say he died for all which is one of the the great Armenian teachings the great heritage we have as Methodists we believe Jesus died for everyone that there is no person that we can go to and say Jesus died for you that that that's a wrong theological statement and in this 1 Corinthians 5 says that one died for all, therefore we believe that all died and, and we're supposed to take the message to all. So we're all reconciled to God through Christ and as part of him reconciling us, he gives us the ministry of reconciliation. As sad, and I got to tell you, I don't know, um, those of you who are parents in here, I don't know if you remember the first time you held your baby. I remember the first time I held my first daughter, and it was an exciting time, and it was a joyous time, and that little seven pound, 10 ounce baby weighed a million pounds. The first time I looked into her eyes, the responsibility that I was her dad, and that she was relying on me for love. If you don't touch a baby, if you don't love a baby, they will die. Um, that's just the way we humans are made. And that she was relying on me for food. And at the time, I just read a study that said it, every baby cost the parent approximately $750,000, and I knew I didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, it's funny. Last night as I was going over these slides and finishing them up was the first time I had that feeling about the gospel. You know, that feeling of unbelievable responsibility that it's, it's our job. God hasn't given anybody else but individuals within the church and the church as an institution to do it. And the funny thing is, and, and it's just, the, you know, we're all made differently. It's the way that, that I'm made, and, and it's funny because my kids hate it, but that's okay. If, if there's an accident, I'm going to stop and I'm going to help out. If, you know... If a tent is, and this happened, if a tent is tumbling through a soccer field because it's um, windy and nobody anchored their tent right, you know how those go. There were 50 parents there, and me and one other guy ran out to the middle of the field and grabbed it before it ran over a kid. Now, that's, you know, that, that's how, how God made me, and I've never felt a burden on that. But all of a sudden last night, it's like, wow, this is us. This is our job. This is our responsibility. There's nobody else that, that's going to do it. Now, Jesus said, if we don't do it, the rocks will cry out. I don't know how well they speak English. I think he was just trying to let us know we really have a job to do. But, but with that said, we are Christ's ambassadors, and it is given to us to be ministers of reconciliation. And think about that word, reconciliation. Now, the verse that I want to key this sermon off of, and I don't know about you, I put the horse up there not because everybody loves horses. 
Which, by the way, everyone in here does love horses, right? Right? This horse has a bridle on. It's not a bit, it's a bridle. But the thing about a horse, um, and, and just a couple weeks ago, I was uh, over by Salina um, and, and was in someone's horse barn, and you know, the horse comes up to you and they're huge. But you can just you can just pet them. You can grab them by the hand. Now, if you don't know what they're doing, they can kill you. There is more power in a horse than in just about anything that we can come in contact with on a daily basis. They're incredibly powerful. But yet, with just a bridle and a bit, they can do so much work and if you just know how horses are, they, they love you. They, they want you to pet them. They want you to, to, to be with them. And so the idea that gentleness and power are opposites is just wrong. So that's why there's a horse up there. So here's the verse. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready to give an answer to every man, to every person who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with gentleness and fear. Now, this to me is the key to sharing Christ. First of all, we're living right. We are living in such a way that people see that there's a hope in us. They see that there's a difference in us. They see that we actually care for our neighbor because they're our neighbor and because God's their father, whether they know it or not because Jesus died for that person, whether they know it or not. And we love them, and we have hope in this world, because even when things are bad, Jesus is with us. Now, if we're living that way, people will ask, what's up with you? So the first key of evangelism is living a life of faith. The second key is when you're asked, to be ready. And the third key is when you speak, to do it gently and in hope. Now, here the word fear is with gentleness and fear. Fear there is translated in a lot of the newer translations, like the New Revised Standard, as reverence. Uh, the, this is the modern English version, which is a modern translation of the King James. Um, so it says fear. So gentleness and fear, the result of living a godly life and having hope in this world will lead people to ask why we need to be prepared. And we need to be prepared in gentleness and in fear. So, um, St. Francis of Assisi is uh, accredited with saying this, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Now I want everyone to know that I tried to find out, you know, I, I try as your pastor not to pass on stories. All right, not to pass on fables. I want to use the scripture. We're always going to have scripture-based sermon here. Uh, stories sometimes make us feel good. But they don't have the power of scripture. I couldn't find where Francis actually said this. And I've actually found several scholarly <laughs> sites that said he might not have said this. But nevertheless, everyone says he said it. Said it. Whether he said it or not, it's a good thing. It's a good thought. And Francis was a cool guy. <laughs> 